Amen. All right. Well, please be seated. And good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. I know there's a few new folks out there, some old folks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming this morning to Calvary Chapel. I know the weather isn't great. I know there's other competing interests this mor- or today, but hey, you know, you chose Calvary Chapel, and uh, we're honored that you did that, so thank you. Um, if you would, please uh, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. If you need a Bible, just hold up your hand. Um, our ushers will get you a Bible there. We're going to be kind of jumping around to some different scriptures, so you're definitely going to want one to, to follow along today. So as you saw with the videos, uh, Pastor Greg's in a much warmer place than here. Um, not that warm that he needs an asbestos suit, right? Uh, but he is down in California, land of fruit and nuts, so pray for him. Um, <laughs> If you're from California, don't throw the tomatoes right now, please. Anyway, uh, but uh, uh, to keep him in your prayer, especially as he's traveling back. Um, you know, you guys may or may not know this or think about this much, but you know, it kills him not being up here. And uh, so much so, right, he gets in late Saturday night and he's going to be here Sunday morning ready to preach, right? Because he's, he's like, nope, I'm in. I got this. You know, it kills him not being here. So, um, just keep him in your prayers, uh, send him a text, say you're thinking of him, something like that. Uh, it'll mean a lot to him. But uh, um, this morning, we're going to be uh, looking at the first part of Hebrews chapter 11. Um, and we're going to be looking at what faith is, right? So Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. Everyone, you know, there's a lot of folks understand it as that. But we're going to look at what faith is, what faith isn't. And why faith is important, and and God really breaks it down for us here in Hebrews chapter 11 for that. So, you know, here in in modern society, we hear about faith all the time, as a matter of fact, right? In in pop culture, it's all over the place. Um, You know, you may remember the heralded Bible scholar of the 80s, uh, George Michael, right? (laughs) Maybe not the heralded Bible scholar there, right? But he had his song entitled Faith, right? Great. You know, in the lyrics, the chorus says, because I got to have, now, this is, these are the lyrics, okay? I'm not saying they make perfect sense, but, because I got to have faith. I got a faith. It's a verb now. Because I got to have faith, faith. I got to have faith, faith, faith. Awesome, right? I mean, we do. We got to have faith. We know that. And if you just listen to the chorus over and over, he's right. You, you got to have faith. But you listen to the rest of the song, right? It's all about his lustful desire for a sexually immoral relationship. Not seeing how the two go together, right? But that is what our world thinks about faith. Is that true faith? I don't think so, right? If you check out the New York Best Times, or New York Times bestseller list right now under the uh, religion, spirituality, and faith category, uh, a couple of titles you'll find out there. One is The Book of Joy. By the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. The tagline is, a discussion between two spiritual leaders about how to find joy in the face of suffering. You know, again, maybe not exactly what the true definition of faith is and what, what uh, God wants us to get out of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Another one you'll find there is the Four Agreements. Cool. It's by Don Miguel Ruiz. A guide to, con- to conduct, spiritual freedom, and a life with fewer limitations by a Mexican healer. Cool, right? Again, maybe not exactly what God wants us to get out of the topic of faith. I also recently found a news article. It was uh, out of an Australian uh, ABC down there, and it uh, talks about the importance of faith. You can see it up here. It says, uh, what is the role of faith in today's world? And uh, it says, Uh, His name is Paul, and I met him on the streets in Parramatta in Sydney's West. That's what Paul does these days. He walks the streets. He's homeless, and he's alone. But this wasn't always Paul's life. He had a family, a wife, and children. Paul was also once a soldier. He spent 17 years in the Army, including six tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Paul was a sergeant. He led men into battle. That does things to a person, and it has done things to Paul. Terrible things. He's a shell now, bruised and tender. It isn't long before Paul starts to cry. They're just little tears. There's still enough of the soldier to hold himself together, to stop himself falling apart. He tells me war wasn't the hardest part. It was coming home. You're always constantly thinking of home and what's going on back home and your loved ones, Paul said. I don't know 
if it is you that changes or if it's the people that change. I was in Paramata filming the latest episode of The Link. On this show, we go to where the people are to talk to them about what is important in their lives. This week, it was faith. Cool. What role faith plays in people's lives? Also cool. How do they express their faith? Do they question it? Do they even have faith? Most said yes. Faith, belief in something, is important. There were Catholics and Buddhists and Sikhs. One man told me he believes in the dreaming, capital D, the living indigenous connection to creation and being. One man, one of nine children, told me how he, ra- how he was raised in the church but was no longer a believer. So Paul struggles now to believe in anything. He, too, once had faith in God, but it didn't survive war. He says, all I believed in was myself and my mates. Now he doesn't even have that. Paul told me he lost himself. Somewhere there is the man he was, but he doesn't recognize himself anymore. As more tears well up, he said he just wants to find himself, but it is hard. This is the part that's most heartbreaking. It says doctors haven't helped. Pills haven't helped. He's no longer in the army, so he doesn't have his mates. We spoke in front of a church, but that doesn't work either. Paul is among the minority of Australians. About one in five of us who say they have no religious belief. (laughs) Australia is still an overwhelmingly Christian country, according to this author. Based on the most recent government numbers, about two-thirds, or two out of every three people. There are more Buddhists than Muslims, more Muslims than Hindus, and a very small number of Jewish people, fewer than 1%. Of the people I spoke to, all were raised with faith. One woman was born a Buddhist, educated in Catholic schools, and now attends both church and temple. That's a little messed up. Uh, Some made a distinction between religion and spirituality. They were wary of organizations that they believed were more about power than people. So you can kind of see our society's view of faith is a little skewed, right? From what God's view of faith is. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because we're bombarded, we're surrounded by society. Let's just be honest, right? And, And Hebrews talks about that today and how we can adapt to that in our life. And so I want us uh, thinking about that as we, as we go in and look at Hebrews 11 today. Um, one specific thing about faith, I think, that we're, we're going to address today that's very prevalent in society for us. Who, who here has heard the term blind faith? Yeah, right? I mean, actually, I'll bet if we did like word association and, you know, we we're gonna doing that game with someone and you said faith, they'd say blind, Right? Or you say blind, they say faith. Because it's fairly prevalent, right? And we are viewed as having blind faith. They say to be a Christian, you have to have blind faith. Well, Hebrews 11 has a very stark, different view of this. And we're going to look at that this morning. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Lord, I'm excited to be here this morning. I know you've got some great nuggets in your word for us today. And I pray that every heart here will be open and receptive to hear from you this morning. Let the words that come from my mouth not be mine, motivated by self-interest, but let them be your pure and true word. We pray for Pastor Greg this morning as he continues the task of executor of his brother's estate and affairs. Bless his time with old friends as well while he's there, Lord. And I pray that you bring him back safely and swiftly this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So flip over Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to pick up right there. Okay, so it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. All right, these three verses right here, there's a lot in them. So we're going we're gonna to park here for a little bit. Don't get worried. We're going to get out on time. But uh, we will be spending a little bit of time here on these because I I think there's just a lot of information there that goes against what we're taught daily about faith. Okay, so first of all, right here in verse 1, we get a great definition of what faith is. Now, it's a very familiar verse, I think, for a lot of us, and and we all understand, uh, you know, the, the words there. But I think if we look at it 
deeply as we study it here this morning, we're going to see some really interesting nuggets um, that God has for us here. Two key words I want to I want to look at: substance and evidence. Notice those. Maybe underline those in your Bible here, okay? Because they were very important words. And you're going to see that as it's carried forward in the rest of the chapter here. When we look at the Greek words of these roots, we see that substance, it's the Greek word hypostasis. Okay, anyone speak Greek? Perfect, I did great, right? Okay, it really means a foundation. Okay, that's, that's an, an underpinning there. or Something that is firm, that has actual existence. Okay, actual existence. I don't think that's the attribute most people in this world associate with faith. As we read through that article, as we look at what George Michael sings, as we look at those uh, books, right, faith is this just thing, right? There's nothing tangible to it, blind faith. But here again, we look at the word evidence there. It's the Greek word elengos, which means a proof by which things are proved or tested, okay? It's pretty hard and fast, right? Proof. So we have a foundation, you know, a substantial uh, real thing, and then we have a proof as well here. Those two words, as we uh, study in Hebrews 11, are going to come up, and they're going to just be that foundation for us, pun intended, for for our faith. And uh, most people, as we saw here, want to use faith, describing that feeling like we talked about, even Webster's, right? Um, But Webster's defines faith, and one of the definitions says, a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Hmm. Wait a second. Okay. I think we're going to have a problem here. If you look down a little bit further, it says on faith. If it's defining the the phrase on faith, it means without question. Hmm. Okay. Again, we might have a problem here. This is Webster's Dictionary, right? This is a very uh, accepted source of information in the world, and it shows from society what they think. What, What does faith mean? And so when we use that word faith here in the Bible, I think it gets watered down in our lives because of the society around us. But God wants to bring us back here in Hebrews 11 and tell us that that's definitely not what faith is, what we hear in society Faith is not based on nothing. It is not blind. It's not some touchy-feely way for us to describe describe what we don't know. But that's exactly what Satan wants us to think. Because then, guess what? It's much easier to take lightly. It's easier to take our faith lightly when it's just this mythical thing. But when it is evidentiary, when it is hard and fast, when it is a foundation, it's a lot harder to ignore. And you may want to write this next to there in your Bible, but if there is no proof, there is no conviction, right? If there is no proof, there is no conviction. And we're going to look and see what proof we have in our faith this morning as we go there. And that's, that's exactly where the author of Hebrews is going um, with this verse. He's making it clear that true faith is based on proof, conviction, and evidence, so that's why I entitled this morning's message, Substantial Evidence. And, and it's actually twofold. We're getting into the first meaning of it right now, where there is substantial evidence for our faith. And we're going to start talking about that here in just a second. So what proof or evidence are we talking about? We're going to jump to verse 3. So we're going to skip 2 for just a second. And it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, when I read this, the first thing I think of is Romans 1.20. You may want to put that in the margin of your Bible there next to verse 3, right? So Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What does that mean? Right? The way I see it, God's saying, Hey, I created everything around you, to show my glory and power, okay? And we just sang about God's glory and God's power this morning, right? But everything around us is created for that reason. And this is a very fundamental start to our faith. It's listed right here as our starting point for the faith. 
And that's definitely under attack, is it not? That creation screams of God? You're not going to hear that in a school. You're not going to hear that in a university. You're not going to hear that from the campaign trail, right? But you're going to hear it in the Bible. Because creation is, a, uh, is seen as a fantastic myth that takes blind faith to believe. On the other hand, the Big Bang and evolution and random chants are preached from our schools as what? Gospel truth. Interesting. Truth that takes no faith to believe, they'll tell you. You gotta be kidding me, right? You gotta be kidding me. Unfortunately not. Okay, in this civilized world, I'll use air quotes there as well, you have two main competing explanations of how everything came into existence, right? We know it as creation, and then typically what we understand right now is evolution, right? But evolution is also mixed with some other things there with the Big Bang Theory, spontaneous generation, different things like that, because evolution is just how we got from one species into another, but the origin of all that is you know, also encompassed in other theories there as well. But that's basically the scientific theory that's taught these days. In both camps, there's variations on the theme, right? I mean, you've got in the creation side, you have the literal day and the figurative day. You've got various things there, but two big overarching principles here uh, on those major breakouts of what in the civilized world is presented as your competing opinions on how the earth came to existence. So both camps look around at things, people and, and plants and everything that's around, and try to explain how it became the way it is, right? That's what we have in common, and that's about where it stops. Now, if you've ever experienced The Truth Project, it's a great, um, great uh, I think, 12-week series or 12-part series uh, put out by Focus on the Family, and Dr. Del Tackett is your moderator for the whole thing. Um, and he explains this battle between the two viewpoints by using a box, right? And inside the box is creation. Everything that's created is in this box. And the evolutionists will look only inside the box for the answer as to how the stuff got in the box. Where if you just take a step back and, and include outside the box where God is, that's where creation is looking at. There is a creator outside the box who made the stuff in the box. Okay? So, that's kind of the argument between those two camps, right? Did everything just happen without a creator, or is there a creator, right? That's the main difference here um, that we're going to focus on this morning. And let's, let's look at creation here, just for just a second, right? Because that's what it says here. In Hebrews 11, chapter 3, it says, look around you guys. Okay, a couple of simple tests, right? Let's say you're driving down in a neighborhood, and you see this right? Is the first thought that comes in your head, I'll bet a truck full of materials driving down the road hit a pothole, sending all the materials flying in the air. While in the air, the materials multiplied, morphed color, and finally fell in perfect formation, and voila! We have these houses. That's, that's what you say, right? That's what we say about this, right? God made people we're all individual, yet we have very common things. Just like those houses, there's different colors, but they all look similar, right? But we don't just think they got there by random chance. It's weird, okay? So most of you guys know me. I'm in the Air Force. I've done a lot of flying uh, out over the Middle East, um, unfortunately. But uh, as you fly out over Dubai, anyone ever been to Dubai? United Arab Emirates, yeah, okay, a couple of folks, yeah, yeah. All right, so out there, the Palm Island, right, it's the big thing. So uh, Dubai is the major city in the United Arab Emirates, it's right on the coast, and they've gone, and of course, you know, flaunting all of their money, they decide, hey, we're going to go build this Palm Island out there, right? But um, right next to it also, you see, uh, there's over here, that's uh, the world, it's a map of the world made out of islands, right? It's not complete yet, but they're working on it. But if I started telling people that waves from the Persian Gulf just happen to swirl in the right direction and pile up little islands in perfect shapes that fit together precisely, 
and that little buildings were forced up out of the sand due to the tectonic pressures that were just right to, for, to form metal, glass, concrete, and wood, and that these swirling waves randomly connected everything together and put roads, a power grid, water, and sewer systems. If I even started to say this, I heard the chuckles, right? I'd be called crazy, would I not? If I thought that about that island? Surely, looking around at those houses and these islands, what is the thought that enters your mind? Someone designed this. Someone drew up plans and someone built this. We don't think it just happened. Just the same way, when you look at the complexity of creation, the delicate balances that are maintained just to sustain life on earth, you see that there is absolute evidence that there's a creator behind it all. But when we say that, outside of these walls, what do we hear? You're crazy, right? All right, so I have a three-minute video here showing some of what we hear. Uh, this is from Richard Dawkins, um, you know, a very outspoken atheist and evolutionist. And so uh, go ahead and play that about three-minute video. Anybody here. who thinks that the world is less than 10,000 years old is an enormous number of creationists, especially in America, but not only in America, do think. Uh, the best excuse for them is lamentable ignorance. Ignorance is no crime, uh, but it, it's something to be remedied by education. Anybody who is not ignorant, anybody who's been shown the facts and still believes the world is less than 10,000 years old, there's got to be something wrong with them. The, to give an idea of the magnitude of the error, to believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old, given that we know the world is actually 4.6 billion years old, it's equivalent to believing that the width of North America, right across from New York to San Francisco, is less than 10 yards. I mean, that's the scale of the error we're talking about. So you've either got to be staggeringly ignorant, which most of them are, or if you're not ignorant, you've got to be insane. I think that religious upbringing is immensely powerful, and if it's hammered into you as a young child, it can be really quite difficult to get rid of in later life, especially if, when you were a child, you were told the devil will come and will try to persuade you of error, remain steadfast, don't listen. Um, sometimes they were even told things like, don't believe when people bring something they call evidence. Faith is more important than evidence. I mean, it's really a, a, a really appalling stranglehold that these archaic beliefs have on minds that have been warped since childhood. It's such a privilege to understand where we come from, a privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859, uh, that to deny children that privilege is wicked. Uh, it's um, a deprivation which should not be visited on any child when the truth is so staggeringly exciting. It really is an enormously exciting thought that we are cousins of all living creatures, that we have a history of four billion years of slow, gradual evolution. Just think about four billion years of slow, gradual history. That's not something we can easily take on board. But the effort of doing so is well worth it. It's such a, a beautiful thought that we are the heirs of four billion years of evil, maybe 3.5 billion years of evolution, and that we are cousins of all living things. When you put that against the measly, piddling little ideas that are in Genesis, it's just no comparison. And it's a, a sad and diminishing deprivation of a child's opportunities to be denied that knowledge. Can't make that stuff up, guys. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> That's what I put in my notes here. Wow. Words can't express how I feel watching that. You know, I feel sad for the man. You know, I also feel a little bit angry due to the platform he has that been given, and he's giving that message out. He's duped millions of people with his teachings. 
How sad. But as Christians, we're charged not to be duped. And while you may be called insane, or uh, any number of other things that he uh, mentioned up there, we're charged to look around and to truly see the mighty and powerful God that created all of this. Notice Richard Dawkins said he's excited for what evolution tells us. You know what evolution tells you? You are worth nothing, right? If you die today, no one will ever remember you. Your nothing you did is ever important, right? No one loves you. And that's the message the devil is sending. God says, no, I created you. You are formed in my image. I love you. And evolution and, and the duping that's going on there, they look at that and they're excited about it. And it makes me sad. The power and might of our God is what is referred to as unseen, right, in, in verse 3. Because God is unseen to us in our human eye. But he created all that is seen. And the creator is outside that box that we talked about. And that's where we need to look for the answers. So looking back at verse 2, I told you we'd come back to verse 2 there, right? Um, when we look for the creator outside the box, that will earn us a good testimony, right? Verse 2 says, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. So we're actually charged to live by faith, all right? So this is where we're going to start picking up here on, on the rest of the chapter. But first we're going to look at a couple of things. You can write them in your margins, but I, I also encourage you to turn to them here because there's some great, great cross references here <clears throat> to the elders obtaining good testimony, right? First we're going to look at Romans 1.17. And it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Similarly, Galatians 3.11 says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. There it is again. Now, if you think those are too distant of references for this and I'm making a stretch, okay, just turn back to the end of chapter 10 in uh, Hebrews. 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So this is, this is where we're setting up here, right? Faith is important to us because we need to live our faith. Okay? That's what verse 2 is saying, that, that the elders, so we're going to look at some of these here, the elders obtained a good testimony because they lived out their faith. So what does this look like? How does it look to live out our faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to pick up in verse 4. Okay, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. All right, so he's talking about Abel here, right? And this is that age-old struggle, you know, we all know about Cain and Abel. But uh, flip with me now to Genesis. Keep a finger in Hebrews, or a bulletin, or whatever. Those are free, by the way. You can take them with you, the bulletins. Um, our gift to you. We spare no cost. You're welcome. All right. Flip back to Genesis, and we're going to be in chapter 4, okay? <clears throat> so the story of Cain and Abel is in Genesis 4, and basically uh, verses 1 through 8 there. And a couple of key points there um, is Cain was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, right? So we're going all the way back, right? We're going way back. Cain is the firstborn of Adam and Eve. He's a farmer. Abel is his brother, obviously not the firstborn. Um, Cain brings an offering, right? And as we look there in verse 3, sorry, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. All right, so Cain brings an offering. Great, right? An offering of the fruit of the ground, and he brings it to the Lord. So then we also see Abel, he was a sheep herder, right? And he brought what? 
You move on down there just a little bit and uh, says, verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And then we also see, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. All right. So we're going way back to all of this. And uh, what's the difference there, right? What was the difference between these two? Abel brought of his firstborn, right, of his flock. Cain just brought of his uh, fruit of the ground. So Cain was living out his faith by thinking of God first. And that's an important point. And you may want to write that in the margin there. Um, uh, and we're going to go through these again here in a second. But what we learn out from Cain living out his, or Abel living out his faith, excuse me, is thinking of God first, right? Abel brought of his first fruits. He said, God, I'm giving to you first, and then I'll take care of me, right? So picking up now uh, back in Hebrews 11, so flip back, but keep your finger there because we're coming right back to Genesis, but go back to Hebrews 11, we're in verse 5. It says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found. The quotes here, right? These are the words that are used in Genesis. It says, And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Underline that. He pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see here Enoch never died. He never faced death. Amen? Right? Now, this is obviously he, God is showing us by Enoch not facing physical death, there's a parallel for us that if we follow after Enoch, we will be spared spiritual death, right? So his story is in Genesis chapter 5. So now flip back over. Verse 21 is where we pick up for Enoch. And it says, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So that's where they, right, he was seen not, for the, God took him. But look at verse 24 there. He says, and Enoch walked with God. So over in Hebrews, it says he pleased God, right? Here it says he walked with God. So we can see that walking with God is pleasing to God. So from Enoch, we learn we need to walk with God. But it's impossible to walk with God if you don't acknowledge him as your God, right? So that's a very important point there, and you can write that next to Enoch, is walk with God. So verse 7, uh, back in Hebrews chapter 11, get a little finger gymnastics this morning, says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Okay, so now we're on to the story of Noah and his ginormous boat, right? Back in Genesis 6, so back over to 6, 9 through 22. And it goes on beyond that as well, obviously, but uh, this is the key part right here. Um, so verse 9 specifically says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Okay, so again, now we see him walking with God, just like Enoch did. But he also says he's a just man, perfect in his generations, right? What was going on all around Noah? Evil. Did Noah cave? No, right? He stood up. He was just. And that's what we can learn from Noah here, right? In living out of our faith. And uh, he was attributed as a just man and walking with God, just like Enoch. Uh, and like Enoch, Noah also was spared judgment and death, was he not? Because God came and destroyed the whole earth, every living thing he killed, minus Noah and his family and the two-by-two two that went on to the uh, Boat there, right? So he was found just amongst the rampant wickedness that surrounded him because he walked with God. And he walked with God, write this down, 
out of a fear of God. So that's the next thing that we can learn there from Noah, right? The fear of God. And that was in verse 9 there, right? All right. So flipping back, uh, we are in Hebrews 11 again, verse 8. Moving on to the next example. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. All right, this is where it really starts getting good, guys. Okay, so hang with me here. So this is referencing the promise that was given to Abram at the time, right? Not Abraham yet. And that was back in Genesis chapter 15. So flip back over to Genesis. Go forward to chapter 15. And you can write all these down. If your study Bible doesn't already have these in it, write these down over in Hebrews because they're great stories to go read. And they're just like those little summary excerpts in Hebrews. But you go read the story over here, okay? So we're going to read uh, Genesis 15, 1 through 6. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, no one in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, referencing Eliezer, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. That's the story of Abram, right? He was given this promise saying, yeah, you don't have a son yet. And you may not be able to see how everything's lining up. But look at the stars. That's how many people are going to call you father when I'm done with you. Right? Now, Abram's, Abram's little pea brain is like, but dude, God, were you not listening? I don't have a son. How does that happen? You may not have been around for a little while here, but you know, you're going to make a son. They make sons. That's how you get all these that call you father. And God is saying, I got this. But he gave him a promise, right? And Abram believed the promise, and that is what was counted him righteousness, is what we learn here. Now, another interesting point here, as we read in Hebrews, right? After the promise was given, God called him out of the land he was in, to another land. This is great foreshadowing here, okay? Hang on to that thought. We're coming back to that. Um, but we're going to pick up back up here. Keep Stay in Genesis 15, verses 7 through 11 here. It says, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. All right. So he says, I believe you, God. I don't know how you're going to do this. And you're t t telling me to go somewhere else, but I'm going to... And then God says, offer a sacrifice, and Abram's, uh, Abram gives the sacrifice, right? And prepares it for God, just as he was told to do. But look at verse 11. I think this is so easy to miss, but it's a great point as we look at Abram here in his faith. Abram prepares this sacrifice. What came down to try to steal it? Vultures. An unclean, filthy animal. One might think of the devil being a vulture looking to steal, kill, and destroy, and eat the dead, right? Like the baby seal. Sorry you had to see that this morning. Anyway, <clears throat> um, but what did Abram do? Drove them away. Underline that. Drove them away. Church, does the devil ever try to steal your sacrifice to God? 
What are you to do? Drive him away. Say, no. This is my sacrifice, my service to God. You bet the devil tries to come and do that. He will try to steal our time, our money, our affections, anything he can to keep us from sacrificing for God. And just like Abram, we have to drive those vultures away. Let's learn that from Abram this morning, right? We need to do that in our lives. Look at verse 12 and 13 right after that. And it says, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, this is God saying to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Okay, maybe not great, right? But what can we learn from this, right? Abram was promised some great things, but he was also promised that those descendants of his will be strangers in a strange land. Now, you guys, if you've been here on a Wednesday night, you know the parallels, right, between uh, the Israelites and the modern church, right? The Israelites are a pattern set for us in the Old Testament of the modern church, of God's people, right? He gives all of this, all, all of the wanderings, all of the uh, promises that are given there in physical form for the Israelites are given as for spiritual form for us. Well, guess what, guys? We're called to be strangers in a strange land, okay? Just like the descendants of Abram were. And some epic foreshadowing going on here for one of the key points still to come. Keep you on the suspense there, right? All right, flip back over to Hebrews 11, verse 11. Actually, I guess it's that way. Sorry. We move on to Sarah here. And it says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, meaning he was pretty old, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now, Sarah's journey of faith, if you know the story, is a little bit rockier than those other cats we just talked about, right? Maybe a little laughter involved in there. Can I get a little amen on that? Does that ever happen in our lives? Hey, guys, there's hope. Look, she's right here as an example for us, right? She went through a season of doubt or amusement with it, but she stuck with Abraham and knew in her heart that God would bring her a child, right? She tried it her own way and ended up with Ishmael. A whole other story. Yeah, a whole can of worms there. But eventually, right, she stuck with Abraham and the promise that God had given. And she knew that the one child that she bore, all the descendants, would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand of the seashore. So here God has given us several examples of faith being lived out. That's the key here, lived out, right? We are to live by faith. We are to live out our faith. And this goes all the way back, all the way to the beginning of mankind, right? Which is not 4.6 billion years ago, by the way, um, in case you're wondering. But uh, let's pick back up in verse 13, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start tying all this together now. Okay. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland. So none of these guys, none of these examples received fulfillment of the promise given them while they lived on the earth, correct? They all lived by faith in an expectant hope, okay? Think of like a, a young girl who looks forward to her wedding day. She plans this thing. She knows it's going to happen. She may not know who yet as a five-year-old girl, right? But they plan this stuff out and they think of what their dress is going to look like and and how the ceremony is going to be, and what this guy is going to be like, and how being married is going to be. We should be that same way. Because we are the bride of Christ, right? As the church, we are the bride of Christ. And we should have that same expectant hope, just like that. And that's what's lived out here, this expectant hope, knowing not just, um, you know, is this going to happen? Just when is it going to happen? 
It's just a matter of time, not if. And here's a key point to all of this, right? It says, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Underline that, please. When they applied for the passport of their country, they had to check a box under the citizenship column that says other, and they had to write in heaven, right? They were not citizens of the earth. Their citizenship is in heaven. They're, they're just passing through, okay? Once that promise was spoken to them, they no longer saw this, things the same way, and neither should we. Once we are spoken that promise, as we become a Christian and we get that promise that we are a new creation and we have a new life and we are going to live with God eternally in heaven, we should look at things differently, okay? Our citizenship changes overnight. Actually, not even overnight. It doesn't take that long. Twinkling of an eye. So just like these folks, their economy changed in an instant. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for a second. Okay, verses 16 through 17 tells us, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's a pretty familiar verse for us, right? For that second one. But it's saying that when we come to Christ, we don't even know Christ as the man, right? We know Christ as God. He came as a man, and he lived out a perfect life, and then he died for our sins. And you skip down a couple of verses down to verse 20. It says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So once we're in Christ, we are a new creation. No longer supposed to look at things the same way we were before. We're to drive away those vultures that pull us back to that, right? To our old self, our old ways, and our old set of values. I like verse 20 here because, you know, it describes us as what? Ambassadors. What's an ambassador? A stranger in a strange land, is he not? An ambassador is not a resident of the country he lives in. He can't be. He must be a citizen of the country he represents. Where does an ambassador spend most of his time? In the embassy. Does the host nation own the embassy? No. That is sovereign land of the country that is being represented. A U.S. embassy overseas is guarded by United States Marines. It is under United States jurisdiction, not the country that it lives in. The ambassador is a representative of the United States, not of whatever country they live in. We are citizens of heaven. Our part that we are responsible for should follow the rules and the likeness of heaven. But yet we are in a foreign land. We are strangers in a strange land. That's how we should operate. We should not feel bound by the laws and customs of the people of this world. We are accountable to and represent God. We follow him and him alone. And we have freedom from our sin. And that sin is the law of this world. I don't know if you know this, but the ruler of this world is Satan. He's been given dominion over this world. That means this world represents lawlessness. The principles, what we saw from Richard Dawkins, that's the world. That is lawlessness and sin, and we have freedom from that. But how do we do this? Well, let's look at what we just learned, right? Abel put God first in his sacrifice. We are to put God first in our sacrifice as well, right? Now, today's Super Bowl Sunday, correct? All right, I see some jerseys out there. Okay, got steel toed boots on, hopefully. Uh, no. As an example, it's an easy example. I, you know, I took the softball. We're going to see what we can do with it here, okay? So, to many, this is Super Bowl Sunday. Many have planned out their activities for this day in the following manner. They mark the time. They get out their day planner, right? And they mark the time of the game. Starts at what time? 4.30, right? So, we mark out that 4.30. Yeah, probably the 9 in case they go over time. We'll mark that. We'll carve it out. Okay, cool. We're good. 
All right, now how much pregame do I really want to watch? Enough, but man, they can get old after. I mean, there's probably 37 hours of pregame you could watch, but we'll, we'll put a little bit in here, right? Okay, all right, so, all right, I'm gonna need to make the nachos and the chili. That's gonna go right here on the day planner, so I got the food at the right time. It can't be too hot, too cold, but I don't wanna miss anything on the game. Oh, man, I got folks coming over. I need to clean the house, so let me put that right here. You get a pretty full day, right? You start feeling bad, like, yeah, it's Sunday, though. You know what? I could probably just go with 30 minutes of pregame. I don't need that hour, hour and a half of pregame. They just can't say the same thing over and over and over anyway. So 30 minutes is probably good. If I clean the house Saturday, okay, okay, good. That, that, okay, I've carved out. I have 10 to 11.30. Exactly. We're good, okay? I can get to the church just as the last song uh, is going. I can hear the message, right? Oh, man, I got to get going. It's 11.30, I got to go. I got to go, right? Okay, but in God's economy, maybe we should put him first. What if, what if looking at that same day, we first put our time of service and worship to God on the calendar, right? It says, you know, God's got me here, and he's got service for me to do. I'm going to put that on there first. And I'm going to leave a little bit of extra fellowship time afterwards with the body because, you know, in the chapter just before in Hebrews 10, 24, or 25, it says, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. And then maybe someone's hurting and I need to spend a little extra time with them. So I'm going to add in a little pad for that too. And then we find that, voila, God still left us plenty of time to watch the Super Bowl. Now, what an amazing God he is, right? Uh, maybe we don't have the perfect spread of nachos and twi- chili and guac. But that's okay, because you'll probably save money on Pepto-Bismol anyway, right? (laughs) So the key here, right, is in all things, to live by faith, we need to put God first in everything. Okay, in our time, in our money, in our ambitions and our desires of our heart, we put God first. (coughs) Then, like Enoch did, we must walk with God. This is living our faith. But you know what that means? We need to know where God's walking, (laughs) right? How do we do that? We start by reading this. God tells us a whole lot of where he's walking right here, right? Once we know where God is walking, we pray and see how he wants us walking with him. Exactly what does he want us doing as that? What role does he have for us? And that's where our faith starts becoming action. That's where we start living out our faith. We should be loving one another, sharing the gospel, encouraging one another, living a life that is representative or an ambassador as a son or daughter of God, right? Our priorities remain with God, and that's going to make us look different to the world, just like Noah did, right? And we'll be a stranger or an alien in a strange land. That's how we'll look. But we will reflect God in all aspects of our life, like we said just as an ambassador reflects all aspects of the country that he's representing. So next, we must ensure that we have what? We learn from Noah, a fear of the Lord, right? All too often, we put God in our pocket. We carry him around with us for when we need him. You know, God, I could probably use you here now. Let me pull you out, put you back, you know, here. Or we drop his name to sound holy. We say some Christianese things, right? Look at me, I'm looking good. That's not a fear of God, guys. That's being flippant with his name. A healthy fear will remind us that though he is our closest friend, (laughs) he's also the creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty God. He is powerful. In addition to that, though, he's our daddy, right? And we don't want daddy to be ashamed of us. So once we've grasped these concepts, we can truly act as strangers in a strange land. And that's another key for living by faith, just like Abraham did. We can live our life not wondering if we will go to heaven, but simply when. The promise will be as real as this podium that I'm standing at, right? The promise was real to all of them. Notice that with Abraham, it said he lived in tents. Did you catch that? He lived in tents. What does that mean? He is ready to go. He is not, he is looking forward to the city with foundations, the city made by God is what it says. 
He's saying, I am temporary here, and I'm going to keep myself as mobile as possible, right? We should all be ready to go at a moment's notice. Go where? Go to heaven, right? Our bags should be packed and waiting by the tent opening every day that we get up, right? Because we could be called home at any time, and we should be prepared for that. That means we don't cling to our money or our family, our stuff, our job, or even life itself because it's temporary, If we aren't willing to sacrifice all of this to be with Jesus, then we're just not living as strangers in a strange land, right? Finally, we see that even when we might stumble a bit in our faith, we can be fully restored like Sarah. Isn't that good news? I mean, (laughs) sure is for me. There's still hope. Still hope for Andy. So even though there was an inkling of doubt that crept in when she initially received her promise, she recognized it as wrong and returned to her faith in God. So what might cause us to stumble in our faith? I ask you this morning, right? It might be different for each of us. However, the more we are walking in faith, the harder it will be to stumble. As we started today, we were looking at what faith really is and how we can be assured of it, right? And we talked about creation being a great witness of the glory of God. And this is a great starting point. But that's not the end, guys. It's just that. It's a starting point. Because visual evidence in creation validates the word of God. And that's what's key here. Okay? The account of Genesis is validated by what we see around us, despite what Richard Dawkins may say and believe. And there are so many more things that validate this word of God and validate everything in here is true. Because guess what also is included in here? The promise. And when we validate the word... We validate the promise. That's what solidifies the promise and makes us able to see it just as real as this podium here, right? That is living our faith. If you've uh, never read the books uh, Case for Christ uh, or Case for Faith, I encourage you to do it. Written by Lee Strobel. He was a devout atheist, okay? There's a movie out as well. It's a little bit cheesy, but it's a good movie. Um, But his wife got saved one day and made it his mission. He made it his mission to refute Christianity. Because he was was like, babe, you've gone wacky on me. i got to fix you. So he was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And he undertook a story to do just that, debunk Christ. But what he found was shocking to him. He found that not only could he not refute the existence, death, and resurrection of Jesus, there was actually strong evidence, evidence, to support the story. Many accounts written not only in the Bible, right? There are separate independent accounts not contained in the Bible in in secular writing that showed Jesus' walk on the earth and that he had disciples. And that all of these disciples went to the grave in an expedited fashion, I might add, claiming that he is the risen Messiah. All of them. And he said, That's just statistically not possible if Jesus didn't exist. If all these people that knew him say he died and they saw him after he died and he was risen and they were killed because of that, one of them would have cracked. One of them at least would have cracked. But there's no evidence. The evidence supports that Jesus was real and that he died and he rose and he's now in heaven. And this is just one example, right? It's Lee Strobel's example. And we all have experiences in our own life that validate God's word, that validate truth in the word here. And we'll be more receptive to these as we walk more closely with him, right? We'll see those in our life and account them for what they are. But what happens when we see headlines like this, right? North Korea is expanding missile base with eye towards U.S., right? I mean, we've gone through a couple of prophecy updates recently here. And I mean, there's some frightening news out there, right? Does that shake our faith? What about the deadliest and most destructive fire in California's history, the Camp Fire? What about 20 killed, dozens wounded in Philippines church bombing? Does that shake your faith? It does for some. What about when we see New York pass a law legalizing third trimester abortion? What then? Is your faith shaken? It shouldn't be, okay? Your faith should actually be stronger when you see these. No, I'm not smoking crack. I haven't been down to Colorado. 
Why should it be uh, stronger? All of that is in here. It is all prophesied in here. There will be wars and rumor of wars. There will be earthquakes and famine and pestilence. There will be rampant evil in the land. All of that is prophesied in here. God says it's going to happen. When we see it happen, that just validated the promise of heaven. Seems crazy, right? But the tougher it gets, the stronger your faith should be. But the enemy wants you to be shaken. He'll say things like, why didn't God protect that church in the Philippines? Sure, it, you know, if, if this came up in a discussion with some of your friends, they'd ask that. Really? I thought God protects you guys. He didn't do such a great job, did he? But Satan was the one orchestrating the attack all along. And then he's the one feeding that doubt. Why does God not protect the unborn babies in New York? Does he not love New York babies? But Satan is roaring like a lion, looking for whom he can steal, kill, and destroy, right? These things are tragic, and God does not want any of them to happen. He sheds tears every time one of these things happen. But since he gave us free will, this is the price that he has said must be paid that we have to pay for the sin we brought into the world. It breaks his heart, though, guys. And it should break our heart as well, but it should strengthen our faith. I want you to look back at Romans 1.17 for a minute. And it says, for in, the, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. As we see here, faith is something that is living and active in us. As we live our faith, it, it is growing. It needs to be renewed and fed and worked out, right? It needs to grow. And as, we're, as we exercise our faith, our faith grows. I like how it's written in the English Standard Version, and I put it up here for you. It says, for in righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So our demonstration of faith as we're living it out, just as these elders of the faith lived it out, will strengthen our faith as well as the faith of others. It's a cycle, right? We have faith because there's evidence, and as there's more evidence, our life shows it, which is evidence to our life and other people's life. And the evidence just builds upon itself, and it just continues to build, and it makes it stronger and stronger, just as we started here in the Bible with the elders of the faith. And that pattern needs to continue today. Our faith should inspire us and all around, all those around us to build their faith. We are to be an ambassador living our faith. I'll invite Jana and Phoebe up as we look at our last two verses of the morning. All right, back in Hebrews 11, picking up in verse 15. It says, And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So the author is telling us that they could have gone back if they wanted to. However, it never crossed their mind. Look at that. It says, and truly, if they had called to mind that country they left, meaning it never happened. They never looked back. They kept their minds on the things of God, and the things of the world grew strangely dim. That's what we need to do today. It's what we need to do all the time. And I want to take a minute here, and we're going to play uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And if you just lower the lights... I just want us to sing this and just think about these words, okay?
sing this with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the faith in you. And I pray that every person here and everyone that hears this message will know the faith that you desire us to have. And I pray that we all work to put you first and to walk with you in all aspects of our life. Just give us a reverential fear of you and your almighty power, God. Strengthen our faith every day through our own experience and through the experiences of our brothers and sisters around us. Help us grow as a family here at Calvary Chapel and to spread your word to everyone we come in contact with. We love you, Jesus, but we need to love you more. God, just give us that hunger and thirst to get deeper with you, God. Amen.